This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. For those listening to the podcast, this is the scene in The Shining where Shelley Duvall's character realizes that Jack's character hasn't been writing a novel, he's been going insane. And then he appears behind her. A movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. And I'm his partner, Gil Adler. Today we're talking to a, a, a friend of yours. Uh, you, you, you've known Kevin for a little bit, yeah, Gil? Just a little bit. I met him through John Harrison, our, our mutual friend, and is a writer, director, is a wonderful guy. And a guest and, from a few episodes back. Yeah. And he was telling me about a publisher who's also rather a prolific writer. And I thought, gee, I don't really know any anyone like that. And I think it'd be interesting to hear from his perspective, not only about writing, but also about producing and publishing, which he and does. Publishing, yeah. And Kevin, helping young people do that as well. Yeah, Kevin Anderson has published over 140 books, over 50 of which have been on US and international bestseller lists. And he has more than, this is staggering, he has more than 23 million books in print worldwide. He is, he's written, uh, gosh, he's written for the, uh, the Star Trek books. He's written uh, uh, X-File books. He, uh, all, all the new Dune books, he has co-authored with with Brian Herbert, the uh, Frank Herbert's son. Uh, an amazingly prolific man. He, he, I think he, he gets up in the morning and the first thing he does is write and write is the last thing he does at night. You're going to hear more about how he does that and what the process is for him. And hopefully it might help some of you young filmmakers and young writers out there. Yeah. So uh, here's Kevin. The more good writers out there, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I You're here. like to watch good TV shows. I like to watch good movies. I like to read good books. And mm -hmm. and tearing down somebody because they're successful is not conducive to my mission statement. Your your mission statement covers, well, you've, you've published over 140 books over 50 of which have been on U.S. and international bestseller lists, and you've more got more than 23 million books in print worldwide. That's a few. I like to write. And, <laughs> well, I, I, wow. I mean, Kevin, wow. I, it, well, you, sa you, sadly... What's the matter with you, Kevin? I thought I thought you were prolific. What's the matter with you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I just kind of did the math myself, and I realized that next month is my thirty uh, fifth year since my first book was published, and so um, I mean now I'm 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 much older and slowed way down. I'm only doing like three or four books a year, but there were some times when I was just a Tasmanian devil, and I did like 12 books in a year we're 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 going to talk about that because really what what i'd like to talk about a whole lot is process you know the writing process you've you have broken it down to uh somewhere between an art and a science to be able to be that prolific is is not an easy thing to do you really have to be able to it's more than just discipline but well like i said we'll 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 get to how how you got there. All right. We'll we'll dangle the carrot and let, in, let people in, stay. Well, uh, what part of the country are you from? You, Michigan, right? Uh, Wisconsin. No, Colorado. We're Colorado. Colorado. I'm, I'm okay. Okay. All right. out my window is Pikes Peak right there, and there's some thunderclouds right. coming in. So so I'm I'm glad I'm not hiking this afternoon. And that's what I would I would love to be doing if it was if it was my if if I was a writer like in the movies and all I did was sit around and go, gee, I'm waiting for the muse to strike me with a, a metaphor, um, then I might go out walking. But you know, I've got is, is this the part of the world where, where you're from though? Um, I've been here twenty five years now. Okay, but, but so it's, it's where I'm from, that, I guess. Before that. Before that, I 
I was born in a small town in Wisconsin. So I kind of, my, my childhood was depicted in, in the movie, a Christmas story. That was me. That Everything about that was my childhood. Huh. And, and after I graduated from college, I was the, the nerdy kid. I read comic books. I wanted to talk to people about Lord of the Rings. And I was living in this little farming town. Where and did so you go? I, um, I, I went to college. I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is sort of like an island of Berkeley in the middle of cows and cornfields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But when I graduated, I got a job out in the San Francisco Bay Area as a tech writer. And I moved out to California and it was like like Dorothy opening up the black and white door and there's Technicolor Oz on the other side. Yeah, of it. Yeah. And it was just suddenly I was surrounded by all kinds of people who read books and could talk about interesting things. And it was just just great. What year did you come to the Sunshine State? Uh, 83, I think, something like that. I mean, I got... Um, so I'm I'm in Wisconsin and I graduated in January. I, I, I took so many classes that I graduated a semester early. So I'm graduating in the middle of the winter. You, you are prolific in various ways. Yes. Well, and, and Wisconsin had like this horrible cold snap. It got to like 50 below zero. And I'm and I worked as a waiter and a bartender to put myself through college. And and I'm driving home at like two in the morning. And it's 50 below zero outside and I'm on this lonely country road and my car died because cars don't function at 50 below zero. And I'm sitting out there going, oh, crap, I'm going to die out here because I, where? And and uh, this little old lady drove by and, and stopped and gave me a ride. She said, you look so cold there. But but during that time, I said, if I ever get out of this, I'm only applying to jobs where it's warm. And as soon as I finished that, I sent out resumes to California and Arizona and New Mexico and Texas and and uh, uh, Bay Area is where I ended up. And I lived there for about 15 years uh, before I, I bought my dream house out in Colorado. My my wife and I had been married and, and my writing career took off so much and so did hers that we realized we wanted to be full time writers and you aren't a full-time writer living in the Bay Area. It costs too much. So we moved out to Colorado with the mountains and the forests and camping. And uh, my wife has relatives here. And the land prices back then were a lot cheaper. And and so we we built I, our place. And we've been here for 25 years. I'd like to go back a step. You, you, you said you went out to California for the weather, but you were in Northern California. Yeah, compare that to Wisconsin. Yes, 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 but 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 still, what is it? Uh, was it Twain that said that the coldest winter he ever spent was a summer in San Francisco? Yeah, well, I was in the East Bay, so it was pretty. Hot <laughs> it was there, better so. there. <laughs> a couple degrees warmer. Uh, well, uh, yes, okay. So, but hey, it it still is California, and right. uh, everything's better in California. Well, I mean, being in uh, being in Wisconsin, I mean, there were some state parks and stuff like that, but it was. It was a Norman Rockwell painting. Well, Norman Rockwell and Norman Bates. That was kind of the two things together. <laughs> um, but it was, it really wasn't something that inspired my imagination. And there wasn't a whole lot of places to go. And And I moved out to California and living in the East Bay, I could drive like it, within two hours, I could go into downtown San Francisco. I could go to the Redwood Forest. I could go to the... Pacific Ocean and the beach. I could go to the Sierra Nevadas. I could go to Yellowstone. I mean, I mean Yosemite. Sorry. Um, and in a few more hours, I could drive down through the Central Valley and get to Death Valley in the desert. And the so it was just like yeah, yeah. I I was in an alien planet and I loved it. And it's and a fantastic piece could. of real estate. It there's nothing else quite quite like California. Yeah. Now I just wish all those people would get out of there, and then it would be a nicer. <laughs> Yeah, we we wish that too. Nothing personal, but but anyway, but I love Colorado too, and I I really enjoy being here. And that's kind of, I I get inspired by I do all my writing when I'm out hiking. I I have a, I have a digital recorder. No, I have I my saw. Notes. I go out and I just walk and I tell my story. And I've been doing this for decades now, so that when I'm when I'm out walking, what I'm dictating is pretty much the finished stuff on the page. Um, I, I cleaned it up and, and polished it and stuff, but it's 
if you listen to my tapes, it's like, and well, listen to me, it's not a tape, it's a digital audio. But if you listen to my my audio files, it's like listening to an audio book. I just, I, I visual, instead of typing the words, I visualize the sentences in my head. And I- Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, you know, it's, writing is such a particular thing. The way that you get the words from your head onto whatever that, whether it's a page or whether it's a, a, a recording medium of some kind, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't like writing. I don't, I don't like texting people on a phone because I don't like the medium. Uh, oh, I always dictate. I, I always just hit the little microphone button and dictate it, and yeah, it's I, amusing to see what the speech to text turns into. But, but I, 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 I mean, I, one I, of the one of the things that I really like to hammer in because I, I have unwanted arguments with people who argue with me about whether dictating is real writing and whatever the real writing is here yeah everything else is just capturing the words that i'm making up whether i'm writing it longhand whether i'm dictating it whether i'm typing it it's the words that i think up that is the story and it doesn't it's matter. really how we're getting it to 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 the reader it's simply yeah the, the delivery system that, that that's well, all and my my real problem is when I'm in the zone and I'm in the middle of my story, I'm rattling as fast as I can. I can't type that. I mean, I'm a fast typist, but I can't type that fast right. and I can't handwrite that fast. The only it's way true. that I can capture my my sentences as fast as I think them is by dictating. Yeah. And everybody, you both know people who speak before they think about what they're speaking. So I've, I'm like writing that way, but I, I, I wish sometimes people would actually give a moment's thought before it comes out their mouth, but indeed, that's you know, a different thing. It, you're, you're absolutely right. When, when you're in the zone where you need to be really, it, the words are, are flowing out of your head. The, if, if you're writing the, if you're writing what the characters say, you're probably not getting the characters right. The characters need to speak for themselves. And when you're really there, it flows from them and you're merely the, the typist on their behalf. Well, and and one of the other things is like my dialogue, I can speak it the way people speak. And I've had my audiobook narrators say that my books are some of the easiest ones to narrate because I don't accidentally type seven words that start with the letter W in a row, because that's would never be the way I'd speak it. Right. And and when you're typing it, you don't necessarily hear that. But I like to also, I mean, you you might see this during the interview. I've I've got a cat sitting there, and they'll come and want attention. And I've had like six deliveries at the front door today with with whatever packages are coming, and the phones ringing. If I'm off on a trail, I get all of the sensory input, the trees and the mountains and the wind, and I can I can smell the heat on the rocks, and I can you know see the squirrel running around. But it's not distracting stuff this is it's it's input it's not um i mean i'm i can't tell you how much i hate it when i i'm right in the middle of this big battle scene and the phone rings and it's somebody i have to talk to for half an hour well that's just derailed me right off a cliff and then indeed. i have to get back indeed. to it so indeed when did this process start the you know speaking it speaking <clears throat> your, you know, the words, as opposed to typing the words, how long have you been doing that as opposed to just typing them? No, I mean, first I should give a, a quick little plug because everybody asked me about this so much. I finally wrote it into a little book called On Being a Dictator. And you can just find that on Amazon or whatever, it's five bucks. Cool, but cool, cool, cool. but I, I, I mean, again, I get asked this so much. I finally wrote down everything that everybody asked me and I put it all in there. But um, so I, there have been studies that that show very clearly that your creativity is enhanced if you're if you're moving, if you're doing something rather than just sitting there like a zombie and staring at the screen. And so I would often get to a position where I'm I'm stuck on a book like I, I don't really understand the character or I don't know how to fix this plot tangle or or whatever. And so I would just go out for a walk. I'd go out for a walk and just kind of let things mull over in my head and 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 run it around. And and then I'd go, oh, well, that's like pieces would fall into place. It's just like having a lubrication to your imagination. I love the shower. 
for me, oh. uh, standing in, in, with warm water coming down, man, the thoughts would just flow through my head. Well, I, 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 that's an exactly a similar situation. And I'd be halfway, I'd be a mile away from home and I'd get all these brilliant ideas and I'd run back home and try to write them all down. Well, that didn't, I'd lose them all before they get home. And mm -hmm. so I started carrying a little notepad with me, but that doesn't, to be writing while you're walking and that, that didn't work. So I just, I started taking a little, at the time it was a micro cassette recorder, so little tiny tapes. Sure, sure, sure. And I just take it out and I would, and oh, here's an idea or even just like a character name because I write weird fantasy novels and stuff. And so I would just go for a walk and I'd be going, oh, how about this? And how about that? And, and I'd, I'd start mapping things out. And I got to the point where I would go, oh, well, and chapter one, this happens and chapter two, this happens. And I start like laying it out. And it got to the point where I was doing things so detailed, it was basically a first draft. And then I realized, oh, well, why don't I just write this way? And because at, at the time I was living in California, so there was the Redwoods to go to, and there was Yosemite to go to, and, mm -hmm. and many more obscure places to go. And, and I just, I found that I really liked it. And uh, the, the problem was, though, that I'd spend an hour writing a chapter, then I'd come home and spend another hour typing it, or two hours, really, because it's usually two to one. But that was an hour that I could have been writing another chapter. And so then I went, ah, there are humans who actually type for a living. So I I found the place where I worked, there were people who were like transcriptionists and stuff. And so I hired somebody to just transcribe my tapes. And and now I've got a whole, I burned out so many typists. I think I've ruined so many hands because I write so fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and now I've got like a full on typing service and we just, uh, I get as many, uh, as soon as I get it done, I send it off to them and and I don't waste time transcribing. Now, I, uh, I, I would imagine the other component that allows you to do this, you've got to be a, a real hardcore structuralist. You've got to really, in, in terms of, you know, I know I, I say that because I am. I, I'm, especially if you want to write outside the box, you've got to know how to do the box really, really well. Right. It's, it's, structure if, if you if you allow it to do its work it will tell you what all the scenes need to be and then all you have to do is write the scenes you don't well, have I'm, to i'm a i'm a full bore outliner if i have the book i just finished the one i'm editing right now is 43 chapters turned out to be seventy five thousand words which is your average length of a book like a 350 page uh, book probably and I outline it. I, I like chapter one, this happens, chapter two, this happens. And mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time doing that. And I, I really work on it. And to look, if you're making up a story, there's the creative part in putting that story together. And then there's more of the mechanical part mm -hmm. of putting the words down and, and editing the punctuation and spelling and everything. Well, that creative part can happen while you're typing those words in the first place, or it can happen ahead of time. And I spend all of my, the comparison I use is, if you are hiring somebody to build a football stadium, would you want that person to draw a blueprint first, or you want them to just start digging holes and putting up walls and hope they all fit together? Indeed. That means he's going to have to knock down a bunch of walls and put up other walls and, and put a roof on and, and all this stuff. Well, why not spend some time ahead of time drawing your blueprint, planning where you're going so that you put the walls and the pilings and the foundation in the right place? To me, a writing a 600-page Dune book that I do with Brian Herbert, well, that's like building a stadium. You don't just, it's not like pitching a tent. It's a big, complicated thing. So you don't just go, well, I'm going to go and write whatever I want and hope it all fits together and my co-author will write whatever he wants and let's hope it all fits together in the end. There's no, no way to do it. <laughs> Isn't that he and I are both full on. We, we will brainstorm for days getting all the details right and mm -hmm. we'll outline and we'll rearrange the outline and we'll get it all done uh, so that we spend, you know, the, the old adage for carpenters, you know, measure twice and cut once. Well, 
don't just start cutting boards before you measure them. I want to know what I'm building. And Brian is like that too. And we really plot everything together. We've got a uh, another Dune book. I think it's our 21st wow. Dune book coming out this uh, October, right before Dune Part 2, the movie comes out. What a prolific universe. What a... It's well, Frank awkward. Herbert left 15,000 years of history there and, and hundreds of characters. So there's yeah. there's plenty of room to be exploring things. But yeah, it, it's um, a marvelous universe. It really is. It's it's unlike well, it's it's the it's the best selling series of books. Well, the, the Dune oh. itself, I believe, is the best selling science fiction book of all time. Yeah. I mean, the as far as I know, that's it's not like I can look it up somewhere but we've done our research and that's what we think but but there's it, it's effectively the lord of the rings for science fiction it, it's like the seminal volume of science fiction um and i fell in love with it when i was a kid and i'm just very honored to be working with frank's son using a whole bunch of his notes and everything frank passed away in 1985 i think um so brian and i have been working together since 1990 six ish you never got you never got got to meet frank herbert no he in fact that's kind of one of my my sad stories that when my frank was a huge inspiration to me that i read not just the dune books but every one of his books and he wrote 25 something like that other science fiction books i read all of them and and they inspired me and that's what i wanted to be for science fiction and i um, I sold my very first novel in 1987-ish or some, I, I forget. Don't ask me numbers. I'm I'm too old to remember all these things. Anyway, so I hear I, you. I, hear you. So I, I um, was writing my first novel and I really wanted to um, uh, get Frank Herbert's address so I could send him a signed copy when it was published. And, and I sold the book to Signet Books and it was going to be published and I was able to join the Science Fiction Writers of America, which is sort of like the WGA for science fiction. Well, way smaller than the WGA for science fiction, but, and I got Frank Herbert's exclusive. home address. I would use the word exclusive. Yes. Yes, exclusive. But Frank passed away before my book was published, so I was not able to send it to him and I, I never did get to meet him in person. But but his son is one of my very best friends, and we've spent innumerable hours just pouring through all of his notes and and his draft chapters and everything. You you have had the chance to extend his universe and, and to you wow to really to stomp around and and to to explore to to take it places. Gosh, that, that perhaps well, he hadn't even had a chance to imagine. Wow, it's. It's a fanboy's dream come true. And I'm, really? I mean, I'm, I am an old professional fanboy. That's all. When I grew up as, as a, again, as a little kid in small town, Wisconsin, I was reading Edgar Rice Burroughs and Andre Norton and Dr. Strange comics and, and everything I could get my hands on. And nobody around me read science fiction. I mean, nobody did. And I felt like the odd duck, of course, but, um, but that's what I wanted to be. I would run home from from school, high school, every afternoon. I'd school got out at like three fifteen, and if I ran home, I could get there by three thirty when the Star Trek reruns were on every afternoon. And you know, I had all those memorized, and and I was writing my own stuff. I was writing stories from the time I was like eight years old, and just kept at it. And that's all I ever wanted to be. And yeah. and now I've. Now I've got quite a few things published, but I still love doing it. I can't, I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, they're, uh, the stories are, uh, it's kind of like muscle memory or like, a, like an athlete that's in tip top shape that you, you um, always just, the stories you, come. You, I just keep telling, telling the stories. And, you, you, you have a quote, I am let me get this right. I am serving the purpose for which I was designed. Therefore, I am satisfied with my existence. I said that. Okay. You you said that. <laughs> that that's that's something that you actually wrote. That you seem to be living that 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 very thing. Well, and I I again I if my career crashed and burned and I had to go and get a job as a banker or an insurance salesman, I would be just miserable. 
I have the, this is what I want to do. And it's now to kind of to get to some of the focus of your whole podcast too, but my everything about being a writer is capricious and volatile and you never know what you're going to get next year. And I could have a great year and then I could have a terrible year. Oh, and, God, and, God, and, yes. Well, and the thing that has changed like 10 or 15 years ago, um, well, uh, here's here's a good story. Like in the, in the mid 90s, I had one year where I had seven New York Times bestsellers in one year. I, I had so many book con. I mean, I was like like putting up my hands because they kept throwing book contracts at me. And I loved doing it and I had it made and I was never like, what a, I didn't have to worry about anything else. I was just going to keep writing and that was great. And what I never, ever imagined was that the publishing world would get turned up upside down on its head. That that there used to be like 13, 14 major publishers I could sell something to. Now there are five uh. and they buy much less and Borders bookstore closed. That was half the bookstores in the country. They went away. And and um, there used to be, uh, if you guys remember, mm -hmm. when, there used to be when you would walk into a, a store, every single movie that came out, major movie that came out, somebody wrote the paperback book of that movie. Right. The That's Alan Dean Foster's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. There must have been 10 million copies of that out there. Every bookstore had a rack with the, the Batman movie or everything. And that was a good gig. I did, I don't know, seven, eight, ten of those where uh, they would send me the movie script and I would turn it into a fiction, a book book that people could read. I would try to connect some of the dumb dots that the movie didn't figure out and, yeah. and, into a book. Yeah, sure. and and i wrote 54 star wars projects for lucasfilm wow and what, what, I wrote what, the, just out of curiosity okay what did a conversion from a, a movie screenplay in, into a, a novelization what did that pay back in um, the i get maybe ten thousand dollars for it sometimes fifteen thousand dollars for it that's great now it takes me a month to do and I could do a few of those and I would write Star Wars books while I wrote my own books. And so um, that was my, that was like a job that I, I, I loved writing Star Wars books. I went up to Lucas Ranch over and over again. I met with George Lucas and, and then I met with Chris Carter from the X-Files. And, and then, I mean, this was great, but all of that collapsed that they just stopped doing it. They didn't, Profit wise, it didn't make very much because the studios took such a big licensing fee on it and paperback books never had much of a profit margin. And when Borders books went out of business and grocery stores realized that they could make more money selling flour and sugar than they could selling paperback books, that the bookstore, the book sections went away. And I mean, there's a million different different reasons for it, but that steady work just kind of disappeared. Hmm. And because um it used to be 13 major publishers and now it's down to five and it was almost down to four last year but a court blocked the sale of simon and schuster to penguin random house because that was going to be a monopoly um it, it you could shop your thing around i could i could write a book and send it around and i'd have 12 publishers bidding over it well now there's five and most of them won't bid against each other so you're kind of if they don't want it then then nothing so that's, I didn't change, the publishing world changed. But then I did change because all of that doom and gloom I'm saying, there were just as many doors that opened up because that's when uh, Amazon introduced Kindle. That's when people started being able to publish their own eBooks. You didn't have to go to HarperCollins to get your book published. You could do it yourself. Exactly and so. A lot of people who didn't know what they were doing did it themselves, but I've been doing this for 10 years. I teach a graduate program in publishing to teach people how to do it right. I've got a whole publishing house. I've, I've got, uh, I'm running Kickstarters now, which are paying me way more than the publishers ever paid for a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've got a Kickstarter, you, you did a Kickstarter for for your last, uh, your, your, um, your, uh, your detective who is a, a zombie. Uh, Dan, Dan yeah. Shamble's zombie. Dan Shamble's, yeah. He's, well, so that's, that's a series that I wrote. 
Yeah. I I just love it. It's like the naked gun meets the Adams family. It it is just it's stupid and it's fast paced and it's hilarious. And I have a ball writing those books. It certainly and, seems that way. And we sold it to a, a regular major publisher that published the first four books, but then they kind of lost interest and they didn't want to do any more. Well, I wanted to do more. And I, I like self-published a couple collections and I mean, they, they do fine, but a small indie published book doesn't sell like a, a Bantam book does. And I was kind of like, gee, do people really want me to keep writing the Dan Chamble books? And it was like a four year gap from the last one. And finally, a friend of mine said, you should try a Kickstarter because, you know, the fans are out there and let's see. And so I put up I wanted to repackage all the covers I had all the rights back. So I was republishing them all on my own publishing company. And I ran a Kickstarter for, Hey guys, you want a new Dan Chamble zombie PI novel? And it just flooded in. We had 640 backers. It paid me like three times what the other publisher ever paid. So you had and your went, advance and, and the audience, you know, so you were working, you went directly to your audience. Well, and see, that's one of the big golden things right now is yeah. you cut out about 17 middlemen. It's yeah, like, lots of people I write the book and it yeah. goes to the reader. There are not all kinds of um, sales reps and bookstore reps and distributors and printers and warehouses and everything. It's, I, Kevin, write the book and it gets published and sent to the, the backer who bought it. And it's great. But again, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for a dozen years. Indeed. I know how to design a book. I know how to design a cover. I know how to publish a book. I know how to get it printed. I know how to do all that stuff. And that's not um, a, a comparison I use is that you can walk into a Home Depot when they'll tell you, sure, you can remodel your own bathroom all by yourself. Yeah, most In people. Theory. So, um, you know, the, you, you, you might have the tools, you might have the equipment, but it, it, might, it might not work. So anyway, the Kickstarter gave me a whole different, way of doing things um my I, I think what i'm spouting about is that instead of having one back in the 90s there used to be sort of like one big freeway career path that if you wrote a book you sold it to publishers and they paid you in advance and they sold the books and and i was a new york times bestseller so i sold another book and another one but now it's like you got all these different side roads all over the place and I'm still publishing the Dune book that comes out in October is from Tor books. They've been our loyal publisher for uh, dozens of years and they push the, the Dune books out. And I certainly have a couple of other books from um, if you remember weird tales magazine, I've got a book that weird tales has a book line now and I'll mm -hmm. be writing that one. But I also have the option to, do it myself. I can run a Kickstarter. And and uh, I did a few years ago, I, I've had over 150 short stories published too. And I did a four volume collection of my collected short stories. There is no publisher in the world, no major publisher would want to do a four volume Kevin Anderson short story collection. But I wanted to do that. So I did it myself on my, yeah. my press. And they're fancy and handsome and I like showing them off. And and the cool thing is now all my short stories are organized in these books. So when I get frequent requests from like like wannabe producers or somebody who's interested in an episode of a TV show or something, hey, Kevin, do you have any serial killer stories? I go, here, here's a whole volume. Look at those. And, uh, and so that helps too. To live in a DIY world is is refreshing and I find it rather compelling. I, I mean, Gil and I are approaching, we're about to take a, a show out into the world. We're not going to do it the way we used to a thousand years ago. We're, we're, we're taking it to the audience first and seeing if our audience, you know, Hey, if our audience wants us to do it, we'll walk into buyers with our audience already in hand. Well, and uh, you Why know, I'm, 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 I'm successful at it. So I'm not complaining about anything, but you know, I I really did kind of like the good old days where all I did was write a book and send it somewhere there somewhere, and then I wrote another book. I yeah. mean, it's you're a one man band now. It's a, you got to do all the tasks yourself, all yes. the marketing, all yes, the, yes, yes, all, yes, and yes. the production. And I 
I happen to be married to a very, very good editor. So um, I don't have to hire an editor. I just have to cook her dinner. And, and you know, this that works out. That, that works out just fine. Um, and I've got a really good crew of cover designers. They all, they're, they're in Ukraine. So they're, they, I, I send them the ideas yeah, and I send me these covers back and it's gorgeous. And, and every once in a while I get a, we're going to need three extra days to get this cover done because uh, Kiev just got bombed and all of our power's out and we're in the bomb shelters. So I go, yes, you may have the extra couple days if you need that. And, you, you are good. Yes. Well, Kevin, do you, do you see this uh, going over into film and television? I mean, the process that you're experiencing that you sort of discovered <clears throat> with books and, and publishing of books, do you see that as a, as a, as the next step would be a means towards motion pictures and television doing that? You you mean you don't need $300 million to make a movie? I, I thought you had to have that much money to make a movie. And um, well, see, here's there's an interim step that is happening right now in that um, there are a lot of people that are doing their own indie comics and graphic novels. Yes. So like when I write a book book, it's just me putting words down and then that's, it's easy to format easy yeah. <clears throat> format words on a page and put it into a nice book layout and then get that printed. If mm -hmm. I'm writing comics, which I do, but for regular comic publishers, I'm writing the scripts, but you need to have somebody else to do the artwork and the coloring mm -hmm. and the lettering and, and then color printing yeah. requires. So that's a whole step up, but there are now people who are doing that. They're, they're doing a great mm -hmm. job of it. And some of them are using Kickstarter. Some of them are are just funding it themselves. Um, I'm pretty darn sure there are also indie filmmakers that are doing the, the same thing. And and one of one of the examples that I like to show off, and I and I'm saying this just last night with my wife, we watched um I'd seen it before, but we watched uh, Avatar, The Way of Water. And and it's an astonishing movie. I mean, uh, in, in fact, I think I appreciate it more the second time because I was looking at everything in these scenes is in a three-dimensional space because they're all in water. Mm -hmm. Where people don't normally think that. It's that you're walking on a plane, you're on the ground and you're doing things. But the Abbott, that was it was so beautiful and so lavish and so so lusciously done. And it took him, what, 11, 12 years and... I don't even have any idea what the budget was in that movie. Right. But some of my favorite science fiction ever is the old black and white Outer Limits TV show. Mm -hmm. And those were extraordinarily well written. And what people might remember are the dumb looking rubber monsters. But those stories didn't depend on the special effects. They were engaging stories. Indeed. And you could tell a great story without needing an Avengers Endgame kind of budget. You you don't need to have a Marvel movie where there's 7,000 things going on in the background when you're having two people drinking coffee in a diner. Um, that If you're a good writer and a good filmmaker, you can make something that you can do with a lower budget. And mm -hmm. I happen to be the person that I would prefer a really good story than a bunch of really good special effects. You know, a long time ago, I, I did some work in LA and in New York uh, in film schools. And it was really interesting because the film schools in Los Angeles, they were all about special effects and they were all about the digital and they were all about how, how, econ how, how either economically or not so economically, they could accomplish those things. Whereas when I went back East, and, and Frank Danielle was running with Milos Forman, Columbia University Film School, or even down at NYU, they were all about the written word. They were all about the story and the character and the emotionality of character. And what and what's that interaction like? And I really found it interesting to see the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast, how they were basically, you know, training young people to be in the film business or television business. I think that's that's graduated now. It's got a little bit more sophisticated. I still think too much emphasis is on the special effects, but and not enough is on the written word, and not enough is on the the, the emotion relationship of those characters. But I think it's getting closer. Well, and the East Coast are probably more thinking of of like a a 
a play mindset where you're on a stage yeah. and it has to yeah. be focused on what, what they're doing. And we, my wife and I, just a few weeks ago, we watched uh, Quantumania, the Ant-Man Quantumania movie, just a couple of weeks ago. It was a fun mm -hmm. movie. We enjoyed it. But I, when we started it, when they got into this quantum world, I said, just start looking at what's happening in the background. And, and if you watch, you've got the characters doing something, but there's like 30 things happening in the background. Yeah. And I just sort of wanted to go make it stop. I want to see this story. It was pretty stuff. It was beautiful special effects. But... I, I don't really need to have I, I I remember watching in the theater the second Transformers movie where there's like a hundred big robots bashing a thousand buildings and it's all happening at once. And I'm a big special effects, big movie in the theater guy, but I was like putting my hands over my eyes, going, make it stop, make it stop. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I don't I don't think we need to have something in our face and and in all directions all the time. I, I I want just a little focus on the story sometimes, and the and human think beings. You know, you know, it's really what good stories are about: human beings and how we interact with each other. That's that's it. Well, Kevin, do you I think mean, our 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 life right now is sensory overload? I mean, I I can't get gas without the gas pump having a TV screen giving me an advertisement okay. right above the thing that's telling me I can get five monster energy drinks for ten dollars and and then there's something else it's I, I sound like a crotchety old fart but but really that's why I go but, hiking in, but in the it's forest, an so overload I, it's an overload of the wrong information you know hey we could be inundated with with, with other information that <laughs> that is less it's, it's always trying to sell us stuff I wonder, I wonder if some of that has to do with uh, the effects of uh, video games because I've noticed over the last, say, 30 years in terms of films, films that I enjoyed 30 years ago, and I go back and look at them, even I have a bit of a problem with them because I feel like they're too slow in some places. And and, and they're just, gee, did I really like that 30 years ago? And I look at it now and I go, why Why do I feel that way? What? And and I just think that younger people don't have the patience. They don't, they're not willing to invest what you what we used to invest in, in a film whether it was the first hour or the first half hour or whatever, because the, the gratification today is so immediate with these video games and it gets faster and faster and faster. And I'm just wondering if that has an effect on how people movies today. Well, I mean, we, all of us, we, we are in a situation where we, we, what's coming at us is a fire hose instead of a trickle. And that's how we're trained now that if, if, if something doesn't happen in the first five minutes of a movie, you're going to well, change the channel because yeah. this is boring. Nothing's happening. And I remembered when uh, I tried to introduce my my kid when he was young to like the old classic Star Trek episodes. And I, I love the arena episode where Kirk fights the, the big reptilian Gorn guy and he has to use the resources to build a little cannon and mm -hmm. and. I thought, well, you got to watch this one. This is really good. And we sat down and watched it. And and to today's audience, and actually, this was a, more than a decade ago, it, it is boring. Mm -hmm. It takes about half an hour in the show before you even see the lizard guy. Yeah. I mean, that would nobody would ever do that today. And as mm -hmm. a writer, as a creator right now, we have to recognize that. That means that that um, we're, we're on a... You, you got to have something. You don't have the leisure of uh, like Tolkien, where I'm going to write the Silmarillion before I start something. And, yeah. and, you know, that's, nobody has that patience anymore. And I mean, for good or ill, I mean, that, that, that is what it is. Don't, yeah. we, don't we must take some, I wish it was the old days, but well, I, I think, you know, as filmmakers, we have to take some responsibility for that because, and Hey, we work for a guy who probably is partially responsible for that Joel Silver, because, just cut it faster, cut it faster, cut it faster. Get, hey, come into the scene as late as you possibly can and get out as early as you possibly can. Was was Silver the one that would just like page through the script and say there's too much text here, so it's going to be too slow of a movie? I I I I heard something like that. That, that you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta put like some something yeah. happening. And, yes. And that's yes. actually I mean that's that's good for for pacing that remember in Charles Dickens day, people would sit down with David Copperfield and they had all day long to just sit there and read yeah, without yeah. the phone ringing, without anything. You had 
hours to read. And now you've got it on your phone screen while you're on the bus until the next bus stop. So yeah. that's why James Patterson is such a huge hit because he was one of the first guys to have like these three page chapters and you could get a little nugget of it and you could read and get your story. And it was in, in much uh, smaller pieces. And, and again, I'm not whining. I, I wish it was back in the old days. That is the way it is. Yeah. And we have to write to a sensibility that the audience is not going to give us 50 pages before something happens. If I, I, I think back to Jeff Goldblum's character in The Big Chill, who describes his success as a writer as, as, as happening because he, he's able to write uh, everything he needs to, everything, everything he has to say within the, the time it takes the average person to take a crap. Yeah, I mean, that's those are those are parameters. We work yeah, with. yeah, yeah. So if if you can't do it within that. Another benchmark. <laughs> uh, you have written quite a few franchise for, for franchises like Star Wars and uh, X-Files to assume the voice of a franchise, which as you step into the world, it, it already exists. It has flavors. It has dimensions and, and dynamics. How hard is it to assume the mantle of, of a franchise and write in its voice? Well, I, I've only taken on stuff that I'm already a fan of. So I'm, I was already watching the X-Files. I already loved Star Wars. I already loved Dune. I mean, all, all this stuff. And uh, like one of you guys lives in like Portland or Seattle, right? I live in Vancouver. Vancouver. Okay. So I've been to Vancouver. If I were going to write a story set in Vancouver, I would do everything I could to understand what Vancouver is like, what the what the nightlife is like, what the cafes are like, what the weather is like, what the streets look like, what the uh, what's around, what what kind of the vibe of the people are. And I could write a story set in Vancouver. It's exactly the same to write a story set in the X-Files universe or in the Star Wars universe that except I for Star Wars, I had the movies to watch. And when I was working on it, there were only the three movies. Um, mm -hmm. Be that as it may, but you know, in essence, anyone could do this, but very few people really and truly can because you have to know which details are the important ones that really signify the franchise and which are just, you know, which, what's the cake, what's the icing? And How you do don't you... dare, you don't dare get anything wrong because the fans, this they live this, this is what they sci -fi want. Sci-fi especially. Oh. Hey, I, I spent two seasons doing The Outer Limits, man. Sci-fi fans are nuts. If you get the science fiction wrong, they, they'll, they'll come at you. Not nuts in a good way, but, um, but yeah. Well, I yes, mean, the I, best way possible. But, but think about in a different sense, think, think about um, this is Nikola Tesla, by the way, he's, he, it's his turn to get attention. Indeed. Um, uh, think about James writing, writing Shogun. Like he had to get everything, all those details about, uh, about ancient Japan. And Shogun is effectively a science fiction alien first contact story. Mm -hmm. It's a human being or, or the, the white character thrown into an alien culture. And he learns about it and he has to get, get all the details right. Now, it takes a lot of research. And in Star Wars, it involved me just like, like watching those movies over and over and over and over again. And, and, you're reading some of the other novels that have been published and and there are, there were game handbooks and and getting everything right and i was fortunate in that i was one of the first people writing in the star wars universe so i didn't i mean if somebody asked me today there were like 350 books to read to catch up on and i don't think my brain could handle getting all that stuff but that's quite an amazing statistic all by itself that there were that many books in in that universe well and well i mean for the x files um i mean that is in our modern world with or without monsters i mean that's and i researched the fbi and it turned out that there are a lot of fbi agents who were x files fans and i made some phone calls and and they gave me tour in the San Francisco offices and in the Washington DC offices and and I got some real backstage stuff and I got a, a bunch of the details that I could use in writing my stories 
And the funny thing was, is that once I started really doing research into what the FBI does and what they investigate, I'm realizing that, hey, half of the TV episodes are wrong anyway. I mean, it, it, there are very specific types of crimes that the FBI investigates, and half of the X-Files episodes don't fall into that thing. So, But aside from so, that. But aside from that, you just you you still do your best. And the thing is, you have to really love the show so that you can deliver what the fans want. I mean, if I, if I um, say I didn't like Star Trek and I wrote a Star Trek book, they would smell that a mile away. They would just go, this guy doesn't respect it. This guy doesn't understand it. And and I bring my my fan creds to it when I'm when I'm doing that. I, I think that that's that's quite right. There, there there needs to be fan cred to begin with. Otherwise, how can you otherwise it's just a job. You you're passing on something that you love to to a, a new audience in essence. When I had my full time job as a tech writer, I was writing respirator safety manuals and chemical protective clothing books. And and yeah, that's not that yeah. fun. But writing Star Wars or X Files, Batman, Superman. I I, I wrote the the novelization for uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and I worked in um, uh, Titan AE, and I worked in uh, Supernova. Was not a great movie, and you know there there are movies and Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow that you know you just you live in that universe and you you do. A great job, you hope. You teach. Yes. In fact, this afternoon I was working on my syllabus for the summer summer thing. Um, I I teach. Uh, I run a graduate program in publishing for Western Colorado University, and I've been about to start my fifth cohort, so five years now, and I'm I'm teaching. Most of them are writers about how to be small publishers to publish their own books and distribute them and get reviews and advertise them and and understanding type design and fonts and so you're not teaching them how to write, but you are teaching them how to be writers. Right. I mean, that's the whole that's yeah. that's the second half. I mean, one of the and I'm in my college, we've also got a, a genre fiction MFA program and and nature writing, all kinds of other things. But you know. If the if their college program teaches them how to write their great science fiction book and then turns them loose without any clue what to do with it afterward, yeah. well, then you've only made it to the top of the mountain. You got to make it back down too. And publishing and getting your work out there is is uh, something that's kind of vital. And I and I teach that. I I enjoy it. I've also run uh, for fourteen years now this big thing called Superstars Writing Seminars, where um, it's sort of a very intensive, very supportive um, four-day workshop on the business of writing. Because when we started it 14 years ago, there were lots of writing workshops on how to do characters and how to describe scenes and how to write poetry about cats. But there wasn't anything that told you how to read a contract and how to understand copyright and and uh, how to market your work and how, and we went, thought, well, that's kind of a big missing piece. So we started it, and it's the business yeah. of the writing business. It's otherwise you 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 must well just be a fan. Well, I mean, it. There are so many writers that they they they've written. They could have written the most brilliant book ever, but if nobody reads it, then it's that tree falling in the forest, and nobody hears it. Indeed, so, it is the it's that is the the challenge is to get onto the mountain and then stay on the mountain. So, you know, that's teaching that. And I'm, again, I'm superstars has been a huge, it's one of the, the things on my tombstone. He created superstars. I mean, that, that's one of the great things. And then my, my grad students, I, I they're my Jedi. I mean, I, I get a new group of, of Padawans every year and we, we turn them into Jedi or, or Sith Lords by the time they're done with it. And I really enjoy that. And of course the, be, because I write books, I don't count as a writer in the Writers Guild of America, so I can't join the WGA, so I can't get their health insurance, so I had to pay out of pocket. But now that I work for the university, I can actually get health insurance, which is the 
the bane of many freelance writers because if you pay out of pocket for your health insurance it is it is outrageously expensive yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so if someone were to hire you to write a couple of scripts you you get into the writers guild uh well not right now with the strike going on. Oh well, no, of course not right now. You know, it's, but, but the strike. Well, I mean that's forever. That is one of the. I had I had a whole bunch of irons in the fire that were just ready to take off when the strike hit. So we'll, and I fully support the strike. There's a lot of stuff that they're they're doing that's very important work. It but, is it it is but, madness considering how, how much you've written and and what you've written that you haven't written a gazillion scripts as well. I mean, you could you could you could you could. Well, I've written your, a your approach to, to what you do would work quite quite well doing what we do. Well, it, it's kind of an insular business, the film business, with their the the scriptwriters. Only and until that. you, and then you know people, and suddenly right. you're on the. I'll get thing. I'll get there eventually. After I publish another have 175 books, maybe I'll get there. But you're you're well. overqualified for the gig, man. Yeah. Well. I'll try. I mean, I've I've worked. I mean, I worked on the two Dune movies as a consultant, and and I'm a co-producer on the TV show and and things. So there, I'm working in the business. I just haven't written a script that they made into an episode or a film. But uh, eventually, we'll get this, it. But if this, not, I'm this has to get fixed. Books. This I, I'm sorry, but 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 th this has to get to get fixed. Uh, I have one last question, and then we will let you get back to your incredibly busy writing day. Can can you teach people how to write? You can teach people that have the potential how to meet their potential. And I, I've had people who come that like, uh, Kevin, I really want to be a writer, but I don't have any ideas. And I'm like, well, That's it's a like challenge. saying I want to be a pro football player, but I don't know how to throw a football. I mean, why do you want to be a writer if you don't have any ideas? That it's... it. You you can teach people how to become a better writer if they're already working on things. You can yeah. teach people techniques on how to improve their productivity or how to improve their scene descriptions. Or and I give workshops on you know, like plot structures and things because they're I, I'm you know like if if you go into a doctor's office and he says and here's your MRI and you don't know what to look at that but the doctor knows how mm -hmm. to see all those things. Well, I've spent my career doing x-rays on plots. And so I can see, and I know exactly oh, this. So I'm a terrible person to watch a movie with because I'm always going, oh, this is going to happen. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's a, because there, <laughs> there are tropes. Don't, don't ever be the cop partner of a likable cop because you're going to die by the oh, end of that. Movie. And, and don't ever say the words only three days till retirement and, and things like that. But I have to ask you one last question before I, I, Alan lied when he said that was the last question. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. Uh, we have a mutual friend, John Harrison. And John has just recently come out with a book that I, I believe you published. That and, we published, yes. Yeah. And I just want to give a plug to our audience about that book because I read it and I thought it was fantastic. And we both agree that- What's you know, it called? Wonderful, wonderful it's called writer. Passing Passing Through Veils. Yeah. And my my publishing house is Wordfire Press, like Words on Fire, Wordfire Press. And if you go to wordfirepress.com, just look up John Harrison, you'll you'll see the book there and you can order it. Or it'll it's on Amazon and everything else. But um, but so John and I John worked on the Children of Dune miniseries and the Dune miniseries, and and so yeah. I was that's how I got to know him, and we just stayed friends ever since. And and he had written one or two other books before, and I read some of his other books. But he was interested in getting this one published with a big publisher, and he sent it to me. And I said, well, there's your first mistake. But <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he sent me the book, and and I I read it. And it it's a very creepy, very lyrical, beautifully written. Um, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a creepy, quiet ghost story. It, it's not a Saw movie, and it's not a Friday the 13th movie. It is... It's a psychological creepy and it's a slow build. It would go get, goes against everything we were just talking about, about explosions in the first mm -hmm. five minutes. But mm -hmm. um, but it's a very great ghost story. And I was glad to work with John and we're glad to get it out. And and I designed the cover. I laid out the interior. I kind of did because I, mean, I have people to do this stuff. But because it was John and it was his book, I thought I, I want to 
I want to DIY. I wanted to do this myself and, and mm -hmm. get his book out there. And I, the cover is really creepy, sort of like a spectral face pushing through a fabric. And, and I designed the interior. I think it's a, it's a beautiful book. Yeah, it is. And it's a great read. Anybody wants a really good read. And it's like, you know, it, it's sort of like we were talking about, yes, yes, you're right. Things are have to be faster. But then you look at a movie like A Quiet Place, which takes forever to get going. But it's very creepy and it holds your attention because of that creepiness. I think John's book is similar to that. It's It really sucks you in at the very beginning and you're wondering, where is this going to go? Where, where are they headed? And it just takes its time and pulls you in and pulls you in. Well, and and one last comment, as we keep saying the one last thing, but yeah. but one thing that we didn't really mention is that we are now breaking our audience into a lot of sub audiences that can get their own specific thing. We used to be pretty much a monoculture. There were three TV stations on. Everybody watched the same shows, and there were bestsellers. And everybody read the same books. But now, in part, thanks to Amazon, because you can put in keywords and you can find you can find steampunk vampire detective erotica novels. And there's a whole library, up, yeah. but I'm sure there's a whole fan base for that. And hey, but we're not can, broadcasting. We're podcasting. Yeah. Well, and you can find the audience that likes quiet, chilling ghost stories. It doesn't have to compete against. Stephen King or whatever else is out there, it can just be put the right keywords in there and you can find the audience that likes that kind of book. And, mm -hmm. and I've written some steampunk things. In fact, today as we record this is the one year anniversary of the release of my last novel with Neil Peart, the drummer from Rush who passed away a few years ago. And it's a steampunk fantasy adventure that's got a whole bunch of Rush lyrics all the way through this stuff. And I adore that book and it's found its audience. It's called Clockwork Destiny. It's that's got all kinds of things in it. And it's just that's we find our audience. And it's the same like Amazon has helped me find exactly the kind of music I like to listen to. Mm -hmm. I don't have to listen to top 40 music. I can find the northern European goth chick metal music that I like to listen to. And and that's a good thing. Yeah. Sure enough. Indeed. Kevin, I, I thank you so much for for spending some time with us and, and talking about the craft. <laughs> well, I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy, I mean, that's how I'm so prolific. I like what I'm doing. So clearly it's, it, it wouldn't work the other way. So uh, as we were saying before, I, I did write a book called On Being a Dictator. If you want to learn about the, the dictating stuff, um, my my website is wordfire.com. Go there and there's my book list and everything. And, and, my and what, a, what a book Brown. list. Oh, it's about two years out of date. I just can't keep... They come out faster than I can even put it on the list. So, No worries. I get it there. Well, anyway, thank you. Keep it up. Thanks for keep chatting with you guys. Thank you. Thank keep you. it up, my friend, and we'll, we'll have to do this again sometime. And right. uh, thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. We'll, we'll see you all next time. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast, followed up for what my old pal the Crypt Keeper would have called terrific Crypt content.